Great, everyone will be starting in about two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas Huddleston. I'm the research director at the Migration Policy Group, here to welcome you to our joint webinar with uh, CEPs, with PECOM, and with criminalized humanitarians from around Europe to give you an update on what's going on to protect the right to help migrants and refugees around Europe. Um, for this webinar, we're going to be drawing on a lot of really the latest uh, research that's been going on to see where there are criminalization cases around Europe. And we have been bringing this together through Rizoma, the research social platform on migration and asylum. So we're gonna give you the latest uh, from the Rizoma research and what we've also been seeing now uh, that we've been uh, under lockdown with COVID. And we're also gonna be talking about um, what can be done uh, to push back against this criminalization. So we're going to be talking uh, to two humanitarians, uh, one uh, in Belgium and one who was criminalized in Greece. And we're going to look into their own experiences and what they've uh, been doing to fight back. And we're going to look more broadly at what we should be doing uh, across the European Union with the EU's new migration pact, with the new commissioner, with the new parliament, you know, what can all of us trying to do to make sure that no one in Europe is criminalized simply for offering uh, humanitarian assistance? So I am going to be taking us through this webinar um, as the moderator. Um, just some basic rules. Uh, all of you are muted. Um, if you want to participate, you click the Q&A button down at the bottom of your Zoom, and that will send uh, questions to the panelists, I will be collecting your questions uh, for the Q&A section at the end. So feel free to be asking questions um, already as we go along and I'll be compiling them together. Um, during this webinar, we really encourage you to share uh, what you're learning, what you're thinking um, with your friends. So this webinar is being live cast on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and we encourage you to use the hashtag uh, Defend Solidarity uh, so that we can also be resharing uh, some of your comments afterwards. So please use the hashtag Defend Solidarity um, and link up uh, with all of us at MPG, PCOM, and SEPS uh, on uh, Twitter and on Facebook. Um, so how we're going to work out, I'm going to hand over uh, to our panelists. And then we're going to have a deep Q&A session so that we can really understand how criminalization is evolving across Europe, um, who's been affected, 
how things are changing, and really what all of us uh, can do about that. So I'd first like to take turn over to Senior Research Fellow at SEPS, who has graciously accepted to host this webinar with their facilities. Thank you so much to SEPS, and now for a word of welcome from Sergio. Thank you, Thomas. It's really a pleasure for SEPS to join again forces with the Migration Policy Group and PICUM uh, in organizing this uh, very timely webinar. So really big thanks to both of you. And I'm also really happy to have to come with us two of the brave individuals who have been subject to some of these policies that we will be discussing today. Now, why is this important now? Uh, we indeed are living in COVID-19 uh, pandemic and we have seen uh, some EU governments implementing a number of measures, emergency policies, which uh, basically times uh, freedom of expression and which have an impact on freedom of association, uh, particularly civil society. Now, this is a rule of law issue. Uh, it's very important to keep in mind the fundamental role that uh, non-governmental organizations and civil society play in liberal democracies to keep not only, of course, policies and governments accountable, but also an, as a living expression of human dignity to really provide assistance to those in need, irrespective of their status. And this is an issue not, not only for so, uh, some governments, uh, which are currently most uh, discussed, like the one in Hungary or in Poland, but it's for every single EU government uh, declaring itself or not liberal or illiberal. <clears throat> so the it was extremely important to bring light uh, precisely to these dynamics. Um, also at SEPS, we have been conducting research, providing evidence-based in cooperation also with PICUMA and MPG on the different modalities, you know, how complex it is to grasp uh, what is really going on when it comes to policing humanitarianism, meaning civil society actors, but also critical citizens uh, who basically assist provide assistance and help uh, uh, those in need, um, those in difficulty, but also who are safeguarding the right to life when thinking of search and rescue at sea, for example. And in a context where you have policies which are intentionally, sometimes instrumentally targeting them, trying to really uh, make their job extremely difficult and indirectly and sometimes directly uh, penalizing them in very fundamental ways. Now, in our research, we have identified, of course, and studied about formal cases of criminalization, meaning penal sanctioning or, or bringing some of uh, humanitarians uh, and human rights defenders before justice, um, <clears throat> but also the use of administrative sanctions. But also we have uh, uh, identified other dynamics of policing humanitarianism, including, including informal policing modalities, which are sometimes also very effective in curtailing the work of civil society, such as intimidation and suspicion, uh, basically labeling in a fundamentally wrong and non-evidence-based way people as criminals or quasi-criminals or smugglers, or harassing civil society workers on the ground, doing very legitimate work, very necessary work on the ground, uh, disciplining them as well through financial requirements or limiting funding to these people. And our research and Rizoma research has brought to light precisely who is more targeted. It's usually, you know, the people who are more critical, the people who also play a more uh, watchdog role, the people who irrespective of national politics or migration or refugee, they are simply there to provide help to anyone in need. These are the people who unfortunately, uh, irrespective of the fact that they play such a fundamental role, as I said before, in our democracies, are the first ones uh, suffering and experiencing these uh, consequences. And I'm sure that today we will be exploring the effects the chilling effect. Sometimes the purpose is basically making life of these people impossible. Really exhausting those people, really like chilling effect, making, um, you know, it feels like indeed someone is being harassed. It's exactly the same feeling. 
and uh, trust. Societal mistrust in moments when we actually need mutual trust. We need to work together. We need more solidarity. This is very present in European Union policy um, uh, making. And I think it's a very strong and important message to keep on insisting that we need measures that build trust and uh, solidarity. So just to conclude, I think that um, it is also very uh, important to have um, a very detailed understanding and assessment, country specific in the EU, of the exact dynamics and implementations of these policies. Because it's very difficult to grasp. Sometimes it's hidden. So, uh, and this is something that Rizoma has contributed to uh, very well, and I hope that we will be able to continue with this work. Thank you so much, Sergio. Indeed, uh, you can go into that first discussion brief from Rizoma that really talked about, as you say, all of the impacts that this has not just on um, the people who are criminalized, but on the migrants and refugees that they are working with, and uh, for all of us uh, who want to see the European Union function with normal, humane migration policies. Um, now, we want to now really look at what is this issue? Um, who is it affecting? Um, and what has been changing over the past few years? And to really look at that, we turn to PCOM, the Platform for International Cooperation on Documented Migrants, who really has been putting this issue uh, on the agenda for decades and have put it on the agenda of all of our organizations. So I turn to Michel Lavoie, director uh, of PCOM, uh, to give us the background on what's, uh, how has this emerged um, across Europe. Michel, over to you. Thanks very much, Tomas, and really great to be doing this together uh, with MPG uh, and SEFs uh, and to continue what uh, we've been working on for a couple of years already. Um, so I wanted to uh, start off by saying that even though we will hear more in depth uh, on these particular cases, we have on this call people who are criminalized, and this is a huge phenomenon nowadays. It's not a new phenomenon. Solidarity towards undocumented migrants has been a reality in the EU for as long as the EU has had a common and asylum and migration policy, which has been since 1999. Uh, we just celebrated, in the sense, last year the 20th anniversary of this common policy. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, when the EU facilitation directive was adopted in 2002, the UNHCR and the European Parliament already criticized some of the provisions of that directive, fearing that at that organization of humanitarian workers and human rights defenders. And my organization, PICOM, at the same time was going through a process where we were gathering information about cases on the ground before the directive was adopted in 2002 and right afterwards. And this was uh, the findings of the Book of Solidarity. And we found by looking at uh, roughly 10 EU member states that there was an alarming tendency already at the time to criminalize assistance to undocumented migrants. Um, since that time, there have been more than hundreds of individuals who've been criminalized all over the EU um, for rescuing migrants at sea, for giving food and water to people in distress, for providing shelter or rental accommodation, for informing migrants about their rights. And for many years, there was no centralized data collection on these cases. So it was kind of hard to monitor all this in a comprehensive way. And that's why we were very grateful to be all working together in this Rizoma project where we could gather and monitor this. Um, and Rizoma has concluded that since 2015, when we saw so many more people arriving in Europe and also so many more uh, asking for asylum or other protection and not being granted it and not being returned, um, that in this whole five year plus period, more than 170 people have been criminalized um, during this period. So what do we think the reasons are for this trend to criminalization of solidarity? I would say briefly three. First, um, the criminalization of solidarity with migrants is linked to the criminalization of migration itself. Um, the Fundamental Rights Study, uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency did a study in 2014, and they saw that um, there were 25 member states uh, who were criminalizing irregular entry and stay. Now we would say, because the UK is out, that there are currently 24 member states who have legislation 
or a fine uh, that criminalizes entry or stay. Um, the second reason is that in recent years, there's been an increase in xenophobic discourse, and there's been a whole climate of suspicion against NGOs and volunteers helping migrants. Um, NGOs have been accused of, quote, collusion with migrant smuggling, unquote, by the Italian prosecutor Carmelo Zucato. NGOs have been accused of, quote, encouraging human trafficking, unquote, by the Maltese Prime Minister Joseph Muscat. Um, NGOs have been accused of, quote, being a pull factor for migrants by Frontex director Fabrice Legeri, and this pull factor has been also disproved by various studies. A third reason why there has been this increase in criminalization is due to the legal framework, and I think we'll hear about this uh, later as well from other speakers. Um, We've seen, and this also backs up what Sergio has also just said uh, previously, that through the Rizoma research, that even though a lot of the actual cases have resulted, thankfully, in, in acquittals, the harm is greater than the judicial process. The harm is done to the good reputation of NGOs and in individuals, and we'll hear more about this from Anouk and Sean's cases. Um, so in many cases, and this is also what Sergio said, the end goal doesn't actually seem to be the actual conviction in a court case, but it's a wider chilling effect on life-saving activities. Um, by example, um, confiscating NGO vessels or intimidating people and this can be linked to the EU Facilitation Directive of 2002, which defines the crime of facilitation of unauthorized entry, transit, and residence. So contrary to the UN Migrant Smuggling Protocol, which in a sense was the global instrument and the Facilitation Directive was how the EU transposed the global instrument, the UN instrument, the smuggling protocol, says that the facilitation of irregular entry must be criminalized when there's material or financial benefit. But the EU directive criminalizes the facilitation of irregular entry even when there's no financial or material benefit. So in a nutshell, the UN protocol says people who help migrants to enter into a country in an irregular way should be penalized if they make a profit. The EU says anyone who's helping people to enter the EU without a valid document can be criminalized. And what has happened then is that national laws transposing the EU directive have criminalized search and rescue NGOs who brought rescued migrants ashore for humanitarian motives. It's interesting to see that the same facilitation directive on the EU level has an exemption for humanitarian actors. Um, but it's optional and it's adopted only in seven EU member states. Um, in five out of the seven countries, including Greece and Belgium, even with this humanitarian exception, it has not prevented criminalization of humanitarian actors. And we'll hear this from Anouk and Sean's cases. Um, so just to conclude on this uh, European part of it, uh, the European Commission has been called on by the European Parliament to review the situation of this directive and to introduce guidelines that would protect humanitarian activities and the right to help. I would also just conclude by saying briefly, the criminalization has not stopped during COVID, during the pandemic, it has continued. Um, in April last month, Greece published a new joint ministerial decision which regulates NGOs working in the field of migration. And this actually makes it much harder for NGOs to register, to certify their work when they're working on migration. And in a sense, it has a chilling effect. We've heard in France, in Calais, that volunteers from the organization Utopia 56 and Auberge des Migrants were fined because they were providing support to migrants living in informal camps. Um, on Friday, the 24th of April, four members of Utopia 56 were arrested for one day because they were filming the evacuation of a migrant's camp in Grand Sainte. Um, and lastly, and I'll end here, uh, the ship Ellen Curdy was placed just last week under an administrative stop while the Italian Ghost Guard inspects uh, suspicions of irregularities of a technical and operational nature. And so the CI ship noted that the ship has undergone four inspections in Italy and Spain in the past 16 months, 
where on the other hand, it's quite common for coastal states to inspect other states' ships only once a year. So we see that even in this lockdown, there are still the continuation. I will stop here uh, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michelle. I might came, come back to you more about the criminalization dynamics that your members are seeing even during this lockdown. But I think you were really useful to remind us that this is a long-standing old piece of EU law that has allowed these cases to continue to evolve and to allow legislation also to create all this uh, vagueness. Um, and this is where we really were when we started working together um, with you at the Migration Policy Group, trying to look at what are the specific cases, because when we started this about two years ago, there wasn't a lot of information and people were even saying, I don't think that criminalization is really happening. You read about it once or twice and maybe in a few countries, but it's not a, an EU-wide phenomenon. So um, we uh, at MPG have been able to, with uh, all of you and with the criminalized humanitarians, a look at what those cases are. And that's what my colleague, Dr. Camina Conte, is now going to present, um, really, what is happening on criminalization, in which countries, um, who is this uh, affecting? So to really show us the extent of this. Carmina, I believe you have some statistics to show us. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, I have a, a very short presentation uh, where I will show briefly, so as you said, uh, um, how many cases of criminalization of solidarity we have uh, identified during our RISOMA research project and uh, where this took place in, uh, in the member state. So, um, as uh, of December 2019, the research uh, of RISOMA found that at least uh, 171 uh, individuals and have been uh, criminalized uh, and have been involved in at least uh, 60 cases of investigation or a criminal uh, prosecution uh, on the grounds falling uh, under the material scope of uh, the Federation Directive. So we are talking about uh, operation of entry, of stay, uh, residence, uh, transit of uh, irregular migrants into the member states. So this overview uh, represents a wide scale of different experience uh, of uh, um, the divergent implementation of anti-smuggling policies uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe. And we have identified these cases in at least 13 uh, European, uh, European countries. On what ground uh, did these uh, cases took place? Uh, um, the majority of cases were based on the facilitation of entry or transits, so 44 cases. For instance, the case of the Brianzon that uh, uh, were prosecuted for assisting uh, uh, the illegal entry of uh, migrants uh, between the, the Italian and the French border during a protest in 2018, and they were also sentenced. Um, ten cases uh, were based on the, the crime of facilitation of residence. Emblematic is the case of, of German pastors that uh, were granted sanctuary to uh, Sudanese refugees, and they have been investigated uh, for, the, for this reason. In six cases, we have identified that the crimes of isolation uh, were aggravated by multiple accusations and grounds, such as money laundering, membership of uh, criminal organization, espionage, or improper use of documentation. As uh, uh, our research shows, uh, the cases increased exponentially after 2015, when only 15 individuals were under investigation for human smuggling. And in 2018, more than 100 people uh, were involved in investigation or even in criminal prosecution. Uh, at the same time, the number of sea and land migrant arrivals decreased during this, uh, the same time frame between 2015 and 2019. So um, I will conclude this small, present, uh, small presentation by highlighting uh, which country these cases uh, took place. Uh, as you can see, uh, 13 European countries have been uh, involved, and uh, uh, not only the countries that are uh, that are at the external border of the, Euro the European Union, such as Greece, Italy, but also countries that usually are our final destination. Uh, for instance, uh, Sweden, uh, France, Germany, that adopt very restrictive policies in, uh, in the management of the 
internal borders. So to give some example, uh, in, in Greece, we have more than 50 people under investigation. The case, the case of Sean is uh, uh, very emblematic and he will explain more in details uh, the case. But there have been other cases, for instance, the case of Premade Team Humanity that were prosecuted but acquitted, acquitted in 2018. And Italy uh, is the second country most affected with uh, uh, 59 individuals uh, uh, investigated. Uh, the last, the most, the most recent case is the case of uh, Carola Rakete that was uh, put under investigation after disembarking uh, 40 people uh, in, uh, in, C in Sicily. She was released uh, and uh, also the court of cassation in Italy confirmed her acquittal because she was acting on humanitarian ground to save, uh, to save life. Um, the third country most uh, that has been uh, affected um, by, uh, by Canadian Solidarity is France. Uh, I would like to highlight briefly the case of Pierre Mannoni, that is a French uh, teacher researcher who was arrested in 2016 for helping, for giving a lift uh, in his car to three European uh, Eritrean uh, sorry women, and the court of first instance actually um, ruled that he was helping the women to protect their dignity, so he was acquitted. But then the case was appealed and uh, he was sentenced to two months by uh, the court. And then, despite the Court of Cassation pushed the sentence, uh, he's again under uh, trial and he will be tried again in the next month by the Lyon Court uh, or, uh, of Appeal in, uh, in, uh, in France. So uh, these are just some of the cases that we have uh, in so I would like to conclude uh, by saying that our research uh, showed that since 2015, there was a tenfold escalation of judicial prosecution and uh, investigation of uh, uh, people uh, uh, helping migrants, despite the decrease in irregular arrivals in the member states. And target of criminalization are mostly NGOs, volunteers, uh, journalists, mayors, religious uh, leaders. And we, as was already mentioned, we identified that uh, uh, package national uh, laws dealing with uh, smuggling uh, provides a very wide margin of appreciation to the, uh, to the member states to decide what is humanitarian assistance and what is uh, migrant smuggling and uh, uh, therefore increasing the risk for people helping migrants to, uh, to be uh, criminalized. So, I'd like, thank you for your attention. If you need more information about the case, you can uh, reach us anytime. Thank you so much, uh, Carmina. And a few of you have asked uh, if we can share uh, slides of participants. I'm just going to confirm uh, that with all of them and then uh, make sure that they get out uh, to you. Um, but you can also find this research and a really good infographic summarizing all of the research that we've gathered together on the so this kind of gives you the overall trends and through working together, uh, researchers and NGOs, um, it's been really um, great to be able to work directly with people who are facing criminalization, to give them this information, to get other information for them, to put them together, to come up with, uh, with new strategies and to also help them get their stories out and the stories uh, of other people so that we can all celebrate like some of us might have done yesterday when Cédric Guérou had all of his uh, cases, uh, charges dismissed by the Lyon Appeals Court. So hopefully we will also have good news to celebrate in the future with uh, Anouk and, and with Sean um, and that all of us can do what we can to help them but also others, um, refugees, migrants, uh, EU citizens. So we just wanted to give the space now to Anouk and then uh, to Sean to share their experiences and uh, what they've been doing, what they found most effective um, and what they would really like you to do uh, in the future. So uh, over to uh, Anouk. Anouk, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute myself? There you go, now you're fine. 
Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so hello everybody. So my story is uh, a simple story, but very effective on my moral uh, status. Uh, I'm a journalist and three years ago, uh, well, my story started five years ago in the jungle of Calais, uh, where I went and I saw like a human uh, um, discharge, you know, people were living on a slut. And so it started um, I, I just thought this was not possible. And so I invest myself in, in finding solution. And this is the first time when I sh gave, gave shelter to one young Syrian. And after that, the Calais jungle was dismantled and the refugee came to Brussels in the famous Parc Maximilien. And one day I saw on the news, the police uh, coming to that park and uh, rushing all those people out of the park and taking what uh, their belongings, what the little they had, they were taking off them and so the next day i went there and uh, we gave food we talked to them we we tried to find solution and there was a little boy who was uh, 16 by that time he was sudanese and he had a broken um, ha hand and so i said okay just uh, come with me i will uh, help you a little and this is how my problem started because he came home i i gave him food uh, one bed for a night and normally i should say okay you go back to park but he was 16 and I didn't have the heart to do that, so I, um, I, I sheltered him and after one or two months, uh, you know about uh, the Dublin uh, protocol, so he had to, he was Dublin, Dublin, sorry, in Italy. So Belgium, we don't accept people who were Dublin and they would be brought back to Italy. So that was not possible for him. So I tried to find a solution for him to go to uh, Great Britain, which was the El Dorado for them. And by giving one telephone to one person, uh, she was on um, tape, recorded by the police. Um, well, I asked if she knew someone who could help us. And I think one month later, I had like uh, seven policemen who came into my house, who took all my telephone, computer, everything that had, was linked to my uh, work. And I was convicted for human trafficking and for a criminal, international criminal association, which is quite a lot. So 10 years. To pay. And my trial began and it was uh, like, uh, I don't know, it's so difficult to explain because this trial has been postponed, 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 postponed. Finally, we were acquitted two years later and the prosecutor went on appeal. And normally my case should have been uh, decided finally on the 4th and the 5th of May, but what happened because of the COVID, it has been again postponed until uh, March 2021. So, uh, voila. It is, it is like a torture, a moral torture. You have something pending on you, you cannot get your life back. But for me, I have taken a lot of force. It has become something that I want to fight. And for me, what I expect from everybody is uh, not giving the people who want to criminalize reason to do that and fight back and say, uh, okay, humanity, solidarity are values that we cannot forget. So this is about it. Thank you so much, Anouk, and I know how much you've done in uh, Belgium, all of you who are facing these charges, to raise awareness, to mobilize citizens, to get your stories out there. Um, it has really inspired us, and uh, we hope that we can also support others um, across Europe who uh, can learn from some of the very effective strategies that I hope will uh, continue to work out and will not uh, stop Belgians uh, from being uh, afraid to offer humanitarian assistance. Thank you. Um, so now over to Sean, who's joining us uh, from Ireland, but about Greece, uh, one of the many examples of mobile EU citizens who took up the call uh, in 2015-16 to go and help at the Mediterranean um, and didn't receive at some point the warmest welcome from authorities. Um, and I know you're not the only one, uh, Sean, so if you could share what you're still going through in, in Greece, what others are, and what you would recommend for others to be doing. Sure, yeah. I'm going to use the assistance of some slides to put those up now. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience in the so-called migrant crisis and that 
begins on Lesbos. Lesbos is a um, for people seeking asylum in, in Europe. And this is where I went to, to volunteer as a rescue coordinator because I have search and rescue training and things like that. So I coordinated the, the medical and the um, offshore and onshore responses to folks who were in distress. Most of them were asylum seekers. So to quickly kind of talk about what that looked like when I was there. In 2018, um, when I was active on the island, we worked along the shoreline, Moria um, was one of the primary hotspots and it had six and a half thousand people living there. It's about three, over 300% over capacity. And so essentially what happens in this context is that uh, asylum seekers make this dangerous journey and has been alluded, alluded to before. Um, they, are, they are often undertaking these journeys in incredibly... So that is why uh, civilian search and rescue uh, was so necessary on the island. And on the southern shoreline where I coordinated, we were four organizations who provided medical interpretation and uh, rescue vehicles to assist. Um, and despite that kind of assistance, the conditions in and around Moria and Lesbos in general actually created and exacerbated the mental health conditions, as was stated by a number of researchers. And it's really important to note that the conditions were at the time and are um, completely inadequate to deal with, with the numbers of people who are arriving. Um, and so I really want to ground the idea that, in fact, search and rescue, civilian um, participation in trying to assist people was is incredibly necessary. Um, and in, in most cases, it, it, it is done shoulder to shoulder with the authorities. So oftentimes we talk about this tension. And indeed, in my experience, was always working in conjunction with the authorities. Now, despite that cooperation, um, I was arrested and I spent um, over 100 days in, in pre-trial detention, in prison, essentially, for this, um, charges that we are still facing. Um, they are providing immediate assistance to migrant smuggling networks, um, being part of a criminal organization, money laundering, espionage, forgery, um, among others. And in fact, the combined sentence of this would span into the coming centuries and we still face 25 years in prison and I think people often see this as as being incredibly um, dramatic which which it, of course it is but it isn't all that uncommon and I kind of want to ground what these accusations actually um, amount to when compared with the with the evidence that is raised against us so just to unpick some of those accusations and um, because it's an ongoing case I can only speak about what has already been published Human Rights Watch published a report while we were in prison, um, which essentially concluded that the prosecution seeks to criminalize saving lives. And I think that very succinctly kind of captures what, what we have experienced. So when we're accused of things like um, espionage, what they say is, uh, Sean, you and your colleagues you used encrypted communication services. And this is, this is evidence that we were trying to hide information from the authorities. What they don't tell the prosecution is what they're referring to is in fact WhatsApp. The use of WhatsApp in this case is evidence that we are spying. Another thing, and it's a bit more technical, is that the police um, allege that we assisted illegal entry. This is allowing people to cross into Europe um, without being detected by the authorities. Now they say that we were doing that, we were essentially smuggling people who are asylum seekers. Now, by definition, an asylum seeker is exempt from this illegal entry. And so there are, there are a number of internal contradictions in, in the accusations which we face. And those are very important to identify and to allow us to begin unpicking and kind of, kind of challenging the narratives that, that we face. Um, and as it was alluded to before, the point of this, of these prosecutions, at least in my experience, hasn't necessarily been to find folks guilty. It has been sufficient to engage people in these legal battles. And so although this evidence will not stand in court, um, it has been enough to implement this chill factor, this, this idea that people are actually afraid, civilian search and rescuers are afraid of uh, um, necessary um, search and rescue, for instance, or even just handing out blankets or water, any other medical assistance. So when we compare before our arrest to what's happening now on the island, I think there's a stark contrast. And um, despite being already very poor, Moria now houses over 20,000 asylum seekers. Remember, it was already 
way over the the um, the allocated spaces at uh, in 2018. Now we have 20,000 people. Many folks are not permitted to leave their point of first arrival. So we have tonight people will be sleeping cold on the beach because they're not permitted to leave. And this comes at a time after prosecutions like ours, where we were four or five certified NGOs doing bona fide rescue work. Now there are none. And there are none. And I've spoken to people who used to do search and rescue, and they've said things like, we cut our operation to the court battles. So again, that's a chill factor. So we have no more search and rescue. We have no interpreters. We have very few medical resources. And this comes at a time, as of yesterday, there are two confirmed cases of COVID-19. And again, completely inadequate um, services available to these people. Um, I think, and, and another thing that I want to really drive home is that this concerns all of us. Um, even here in Ireland, this is, this is important. We often have these very polarizing conversations, but when you get down to the very core of what's happening here, it, it can affect us all. So imagine that you arrive at the scene of a car accident and you notice someone in need of help. And this is essentially what we did. If you check their, if you check their pulse before you check their passport, you're potentially committing the same kind of crime that we are. And this is despite the fact that according to international law, according to European Union legislation, according to our fundamental values here in the European Union, it is important to provide assistance to people in distress. And I think it's really important that we can kind of bring it back to that core message. What I've noticed in, in moving forward and communicating what's happening is that we need to have a very rational conversation around what is actually occurring and being able to kind of pull away some of the conversations that we have around the fear of, of migration and begin talking about the fact that irrespective of who is making a journey across the border, they are entitled to at least be treated with respect, dignity, and have access to, to healthcare. And so that kind of brings us on to, to what I think we can do. And I've worked with MPG and other organizations um, around increasing like um, participation in European elections. As was identified, a lot of this legislation really comes from the European Union. And so that is definitely a vehicle that we can use um, European elections and such things. I think I'm running out of time, so I will leave it there and happily answer questions if there are any later on. Great, thank you everyone. Um, definitely uh, send in your questions. I've just been uh, connecting them to the, the panelists with our own internal system. So keep them coming about not only individual cases that you know of um, and you want some idea about what strategy they can use, um, but also what can be done um, by your national governments or uh, at the EU level. And please um, continue to share um, either what you're hearing or what you're thinking on Twitter or on Facebook. And remember the hashtag is Defend Solidarity. Um, so here you get an overview of the cases that are still coming in uh, every day. Um, and while we hear about some victories, like we said, we have others who are languishing and are are losing their time, losing their money, losing their energy, um, and uh, are looking for solutions wherever they can. Um, so what particularly can we expect uh, from the EU level done by either EU policymakers or by civil society coming together or by lawyers doing strategic litigation? Uh, so for that, I turn to the person who for me is actually one of the most expert people on uh, criminalization of solidarity, uh, and that's uh, Lina Vosilita from uh, SEPS. So uh, Lina, um, turn over to you. Uh, hello everyone. And it seems we uh, really painted kind of a gloomy picture. So let's try to bring a bit brief, but let's try to, uh, to unpick what, what can you citizens lawyers and civil society as well as um, as well as eu policymakers what we all together can do uh, so first of all uh, first of all we we can uh, or as eu citizens you can get informed learn more about what's happening in your own country as well in uh, across the EU and we are providing some links to our research. Welcome to use it. Also, we encourage you to come together because when we come 
together um, as citizens or as civil, uh, together with civil society, then our voice starts to matter. So uh, you can mobilize together with the uh, with your national human rights platforms for up upholding uh, migrant rights and human dignity, as well joining some European campaigns. Also, as you citizens, you can demand accountability of your own national governments as well as uh, EU institutions that all what they do is in line with the fundamental rights, including the human dignity that we heard a lot. Um, and as EU citizen, you have a right to submit a petition to the European Parliament if you see something is going wrong. And uh, you can also use some of the platforms to alert uh, about various violations. Uh, then what, what we should do once to our organizations, uh, so criminalized individuals and their lawyers actually can do a lot by trying to reframe the claims. Uh, we saw a lot that in these cases, when uh, lawyers are simply trying to not being a smuggler, uh, there is not much uh, what you can gain. It's only uh, acquittal uh, uh, that uh, you, you can get. However, when portraying the situation as kind of opens new channels. And here we have, uh, for example, possibility you, to use UN uh, Human Rights uh, Declaration, uh, Declaration of Human Rights Defenders. There is a special rapporteur at UN level society can submit their complaints. Uh, there is also various mechanisms if people, like we heard of Sean being uh, held in detention for hundred more than 100 days, for example, UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention could intervene in, in such procedures and investigate whether this detention has been necessary and proportionate. Uh, similarly, at the Council of Europe level, we have uh, the court, European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, who can also check uh, whether uh, uh, what has been done is in line with the European Convention of Human Rights and whether other rights such as privacy, family uh, life, freedom of association or assembly have not been uh, violated in the meanwhile. Uh, so turn to the EU. Uh, we have a court in Luxembourg, uh, Court of Justice of the EU, that can assess whether national laws that are transposing EU regulations or directives are in compliance with the fundamental principles. Uh, also, EU uh, supervisory institutions such as Ombudsman or Court of Auditors are looking whether good administration is observed also whether uh, funds, EU funds are being spent in line uh, with the EU values. Uh, similarly, and I mentioned already that the petition, actually we found uh, that lawyers could more strategically use the right to petition and to kind of inform European Parliament by documenting these violations, by sending these petitions to, to the parliament and showing that actually human rights defenders have been criminalized across the EU. And uh, so European parliamentarians could go themselves and carry out field visits and investigate such situations. Uh, then we turn to you policymakers. Uh, so we heard a lot from Michelle and Sergio about the facilitation directive and how uh, how this vague uh, definition is actually impacting uh, people. So first of all, EU legislators in line with better uh, regulation and better legislation guidelines should make it sure that uh, EU facilitation directive is precise enough and is uh, clear for, for those who need to implement uh, what is not a crime, as Carmine mentioned. Um, so we need to narrow the, the definition itself and to bring it back with the UN migrant smuggling protocol. Uh, secondly, European Commission already started to work on exemption of human rights defenders and humanitarian actors from uh, prosecution according to facilitations, uh, facilitators. Uh, 
but that's it's it's still not clear how it's going to look. So uh, civil society and academia are really looking that not only well-established international NGOs would be accepted, but also like citizens, volunteers, activists like uh, uh, Sean and Anouk uh, would also be ex exempted for, for simple acts of kindness and compassion. Uh, finally, uh, our uh, European Parliament could also launch an inquiry and to look into criminalization of uh, there have been so many uh, state prosecutors appeals against acquittals, positive decisions that a uh, person has been innocent. Isn't that form of uh, judicial harassment? Um, European Parliament has tools to look into that. And then uh, if, we, if we zoom out and get a bit of a bigger picture, uh, EU itself or uh, EU would need to make sure that member states themselves are complying with fundamental rights charter, rule of law, and uh, also ensuring democratic accountability. Therefore, we need the kind of ongoing mechanism that would make a check whether member states are still doing it. Uh, then uh, we also would need to kind of to develop a guidelines to respect, protect, and promote human rights defenders because they are no longer issue of external world. There are human rights defenders within the EU and they need to be protected. And EU legislators to, should step it up. And uh, then we also uh, would really like to see EU Fundamental Rights Agency. It has done a tremendous work in documenting uh, all the accusations, disciplining actions and criminalization of rescue NGOs. How this could go one step further also to uh, kind of capture other modes of policing humanitarianism that are more informal in between, such as uh, disciplining, harassment, intimidation, mere suspicion or surveillance, uh, which is very beginning of this. And the last but the, not the least, especially in this COVID-19 situation, uh, it, it's really necessary to, to strengthen civil society actors via dedicated EU funding, especially to enable them to litigate, to conduct their work, to be the watchdogs. Uh, so this is all from us and from our research, and we are uh, happy to share with you more. And uh, maybe we are all in this together, and I'm looking at questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Lena. So um, we have a lot of people in the audience who are working on this um, as individuals, activists, organizations, um, people I can see from EU institutions. So we've got a lot of good questions um, and I wanna make sure that they're listened to. So I'm going to uh, try and match them as well as I can to our speakers and give you a minute to answer. And if you keep on going, I might say that I'll put you uh, first question actually is to Sergio. Uh, this question comes from Chiara, who says, uh, Anouk and Sean's cases are examples of how the facilitation directive's implementation has been deeply endorsed by states uh, through their national policies. Um, in many uh, of the rulings that we see at the national level, there hasn't really been reference to the facilitation's directive. Therefore, the European Court of Justice has not been uh, brought into the matter. Uh, are there reasons for this? Or is this a problem? Is this something that we can do? Thank you, Thomas, and thank you for this question. Um, I think our research has showed that the facilitators package is a wonderful example of worst regulation. Worst regulation in the sense that it is not only unclear, as we've discussed uh, today, the exact scope of the humanitarian exception, but also we see examples of bad implementation. So if indeed the European Commission considers that it is not permitted, that states should exempt civil society and human rights defenders from being criminalized in the context of facilitation of entry, residence and transit, this means that member states that are doing so are in violation of EU law. Now the problem there is that we are looking at an old third pillar instrument. It's a framework decision, it's in combination of a directive. It was adopted in a very uh, non-community method 
framework. And uh, it is a bad law. The European Parliament was criticizing even at the time how bad, badly framed that uh, legislation is, which leaves, of course, also difficulty at times of reaching courts. Now, what we've said is that there should be at least legally binding guidelines by the European Commission really saying what is not smuggling, what should not be considered as smuggling, and also Lisbonizing this instrument. Uh, we can no longer live in a framework decision on third pillar. This needs to be Lisbonized uh, for the sake of uh, clarity and consistent of EU law and really in compliance with better regulation, better regulation at EU level. Right. Thank you, Sergio. And I would say if people are interested more in these different policy options, they should go into the Rizoma policy option brief that go into some of these details. But my next question are, are from Michelle. Um, so uh, we have from Mies um, asking for any latest uh, news that you're getting from members about uh, different cases of criminalization. You started to talk a little bit about that. So I give you the chance if you want to say more about how um, the criminalization dynamics are different uh, under lockdown. But a, a broader question as well um, from Begum Bastas uh, saying that the criminalization of solidarity, it's not just targeting humanitarian uh, individuals, but also human rights defenders um, who are doing their work inside the EU, but also outside the EU. Human rights defenders, these invisible fighters sometimes, be better uh, protected. And we have a, a similar question from Sarah Brooks asking, well, how can we actually better disseminate and popularize this concept and what's going on to uh, um, in this uh, crackdown on solidarity? So since your organization works not only on advocacy but communications, I thought you might have some ideas there. Thanks a lot. I think those are great questions. I might just start with the human rights defenders one. Um, actually, I think Sean's description uh, is the clearest of um, what do you do if someone uh, has suffered a car accident? And um, do you go and you try and help them uh, until you wait until an ambulance comes? And then while you're doing that, do you check their passport or not? Example shows that the issue that we're talking about is most likely the simplest in communications of any of the issues on migration that we deal with. It's assistance, um, it's saving lives, it's pulling people out of sea uh, because they're drowning, it's um, taking a person in their car over a mountain because they might suffer from hypothermia, um, it's as Anouk was saying, helping a child um, because they are a child and they have a broken wrist. So actually I think, uh, we, we think that there has always been a strong um, sense of solidarity amongst this whole issue. And this mostly likely has also resulted in a lot of press um, because the, the press actually can has picked up on a lot of these cases and shown the humanity of, of the actions. And it's the, the issues of migration in a sense in its simplest form of just helping another person. Um, so there's a lot of potential, but it really means that we need to have more information. So we need to continuously spread information but we were doing the Rizoma research, one of the most recent gatherings that we had, I think, last year with some of the lawyers concerned, showed that even the data that we've collected is most likely only the tip of the iceberg because we haven't yet received much information. And I think this was also one of the questions. Um, there are other cases that are not necessarily under the protocol of smuggling or they're not being charged under that framework. So how do we capture all of that information? So this is especially important going forward because we need to build on the evidence that we have so far, which we still think is an undercount. Um, and I think also leading them to the issue of human rights defenders, as Lena was saying in her presentation just now at the end, and within the EU framework, the human rights defenders concept has a on the outside the EU towards, it's been developed by the External Action Service and it really, in a sense, establishes guidelines and minimum standards for countries outside the EU and how they defend, how they enable human rights defenders to do the work. How can this be better defined within the EU? I think this is the question for us uh, because the EU actually has guidelines. It has 
means to really ensure good standards for human rights defenders. Um, and so maybe we also need to be working more collaboratively amongst civil society organizations that do work in these areas. Um, one example was uh, the organization Kiza in Cyprus, um, which has been harassed for more than a decade because of its uh, long-standing work on migrants' rights. And they had recognition from a major human rights defenders organization a couple of years ago because of their ongoing work and their ongoing criminalization. And just also briefly, um, we have not heard as many um, input from our members about kind of an increase of cases in criminalization during lockdown, but we have seen some examples. There was an NGO in Barcelona about, I think in March, that was uh, given a potential fine for giving food um, to people um, who needed it during COVID. So I think that once again, the communications element of this is uh, Obviously, we know migrants are suffering enormously because of the lockdowns, so food is crucial. So supporting someone uh, by giving them food is necessary, and then criminalizing them is the extreme shown of a uh, lack of humanity. So I'll just end it there for lack of time. But it's a good point, and if any of you have cases that you know about, do send it to PCOM, uh, MPG, or SEPS, uh, because we are continuing this monitoring. Um, and some of you have done that, so I'm going to turn to Sean and uh, to Anouk as well, because you are in the midst also of thinking about strategy and you've been the one actually linking us up with uh, a lot of other uh, criminalized humanitarians. So I'm just gonna give you three uh, questions that we had and if you have um, strategic uh, ideas or that you're using yourselves or you heard, um, please let us know. So um, one question uh, comes in asking uh, about this case in Malta of the uh, MV Lifeline ship that's had to go to the Court of Appeal to appeal the original decision. Um, has there been a trend that um, criminalized citizens uh, convictions? And often criminalized citizens have to rely on representation from NGO lawyers. Is that also really common or is it really a struggle to get enough legal representation? So that's one question from Malta, if you're interested in it. Uh, another question that I wanted to um, bring in um, comes uh, from the Civil Society uh, Mediterranean uh, Search and Rescue community um, that uh, has often um, faced intimidation because of administrative paperwork, you know, uh, that the ships don't have the right paperwork or they don't uh, fit the environmental laws or the financial uh, irregularities but this doesn't seem to really fit exactly in what the EU regulates, this facilitations package. So is there some other tactic uh, that can be done to deal with that issue? And one, and one last question. Um, we've talked a lot about helping, um, uh, saving people. And this is a question that was asked was, um, do you see also in a country like Belgium uh, that uh, people are facing criminalization for helping people to cross the border or facilitate illegal entry, because we mostly hear about that in places like Italy or France or the border. So, Sean, Anouk, if you want to uh, share any of your experiences or advice on any of these questions. I think that Sean will be uh, the best person to talk about what's happening in the Mediterranean. Uh, so I let him talk first and I will talk about the Belgium situation after. Um, thank you for that vote of confidence. I'm not sure I have too much to say on on the on the specific question in Malta, but I would say that it kind of echoes some of the things that colleagues of mine have said, and that is, and really comes back to this this chill factor is the idea of the question relating to having lawyers and the appeals process. It, it seems to me that, as I said before, it really is enough to put these lengthy and and costly um, processes in front or even just threaten them to already dissuade people from participating in this kind of in the sanctioned work like providing search and rescue or handing up blankets or whatever it might be so certainly i think um certainly i think having lawyers and and the question was specifically is it difficult to find uh, appropriate lawyers or people are relying on on ngo lawyers um 
suppose the NGOs that I that come to my mind would be like um, legal aid NGOs to asylum seekers. That would be a different that would be different law that doesn't really apply to the criminal prosecutions that, that people are facing in Greece, for instance. So they tend to be different lawyers, and therefore they tend to that dissuades people from participating because they don't feel, although there is a lot of support available to NGOs and to individuals who engage in this kind of work, um, they they feel that the risk is, is too high. And so again, imposing just a bit of it and, and making an example of, you know, a, a large number, but a relatively small number of, of humanitarian um, actors is, is already sufficient, um, I think. That would be my answer to that. And question relating to, um, you know what can we do if if the if it exists outside of the land? I think it relates a little bit to intimidation as well. What can we do? What kind of tool can we utilize? Uh, as I said before, um, I think that participating in the legal and the in the um, electoral process is a useful mechanism that we can all engage in, and I think that's something that we haven't perhaps done sufficiently. I voice in, in democratic society. Um, I would say that one of the core issues for me that I've noticed is, is, is one of messaging, as Michelle Lavoie has already said, is that, um, and I think that I haven't been able to do is find the, the, the exact message that that if, if you place this, or if you place what's happening on a political spectrum, um, then you have extreme voices on the other side, and they are fairly oppositional. What I've been able to do is find a narrative that is true, but that everyone can identify as being inherently true. That, you know, irrespective of who you are, no one deserves to drown in the ocean. Messages like that are, are hugely important. So finding a narrative that works for me has been kind of the most important avenue outside of the, the very obvious legal and um, I suppose uh, lobbying tools that we, that we can use. That's what I would say. Thank you for the question. Anouk? Yes, um, for me, the, the situation is like that in Belgium. We are not part of NGO, so we have to take care of all the, the lawyers uh, and everything that is... Uh, we, we pay the lawyers, and etc. So for, we are four in my trial, and for some of the, the people, it is really like a catastrophe, huh? a financial catastrophe. So uh, in Belgium, people, uh, there is uh, some people who gather to help us and to make a petition and uh, to make a crowdfunding to be able to pay, etc. What I really want, because this is, I think, one of the biggest problems for the moment, no one of these cases has been uh, in front of the le Parlement européen, le Parlement, uh, uh, and I wish one case would be so that we finally could have one statement for all Europe uh, countries to say what will be uh, the situation for people like us and what we do risk, because this was, was a, a question also that I saw. Most of the people don't know what they risk by helping. And this is not clear in one country from another. Nobody knows exactly what we can do, what we cannot do. Absolutely. Like this whole process has gotten you also out and communicating and also, as Sean said, involved in elections because I think I voted for you in the last uh, Belgian elections. So it's a great example how all of us become active and it brings us into many different um, but coming back maybe more to the legal uh, strategies, I turn over to Lina. So I don't know if you have anything you want to add on some of these uh, questions about legal strategies. We also had some questions about advocacy strategies, you know, is, is facilitating the, um, is uh, reforming the facilitations directive a, a short term or a longer term priority? What do you know are the next steps uh, at, the, at the EU level? And are there other developments uh, that you're expecting, for example, with the Sadiq Yahoo case uh, in France? Uh, you know, what is this going to mean for future cases in France? So any other, you know, legal developments that you can uh, key us into at the national or EU level in a minute would be uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much for excellent questions. So let's just start from a uh, qu question on the facilitation directive and the uh, uh, guidelines. So guidelines for sure, maybe a very short term goal, but they keep us focused uh, that we want to 
remind EU legislators and national uh, border enforcement officials, uh, law enforcement officials, that uh, fundament, whatever they are doing, it should be done in, in line with the fundamental rights. So therefore, um, it would be very good reminder for to exempt humanitarian actors and those who are upholding uh, human dignity. Then Mark uh, Tilly uh, has uh, highlighted rightly that uh, many of intimidation and harassment and suspicion cases are falling outside of the scope of facilitation, uh, facilitation directive. However, we should be very cautious not to overlook that the very intention or, or the very framing is linked back to this facilitation directive. For example, uh, that um, for law enforcement, uh, uh, for police to deploy uh, secret agents to infiltrate and search and rescue boats, you cannot do it without having some uh, criminal law uh, in your backup that you are kind of, uh, that you can use it. And all this framing that uh, it's not clear uh, who are these people, but that they are not migrant smugglers. It's, uh, it's in a long way, uh, run undermining and uh, escalating uh, activities, harassment, intimidation against uh, those volunteers and citizens. Because in our empiric research that we've done in Greece and Italy, we saw that prosecutions also didn't start it from one day to another. There has been a lot of suspicion, distrust within society, especially between law enforcement and those uh, then it, it slowly built up. It started um, checking tickets, car, car parking, uh, where the vessels are registered, where the flagship, it's a correct uh, flagship state and so on. And this added up and kind of in the very end culminated with the criminal case of being whether or not these people are migrant smugglers. But we have to see that logic and all the analysis is done within this frame and therefore it's very, um, very difficult and we, we really need to uh, linking back to human rights defenders and Sarah's question and also uh, it's it's very important to see from the human rights defenders approach uh, because uh, and to have some kind of guidelines or see or dear guidelines are saying very clearly uh, any le legal provisions that directly or indirectly lead to uh, criminalization of human uh, rights defenders should be immediately remedied and you know like states should uh, also uh, make a, should create a um, environment that, that is conducive to human rights work and i think we, we really need to to have it very clear and to start um, uh, to start raising it up. And then very final uh, on Chiara's question regarding Cedric Heru ruling and uh, and the Pierre Manoni case. Uh, actually, they are, uh, and whether or not they are related, actually we saw that it has been really related because Cedric Heru uh, case has been uh, made on the basis of facilitation of entry. So kind of the court said, when it comes to facilitation uh, of entry and residence, when people are already here in France, uh, fraternity principle must apply and it needs to be upholded. However, they left it kind of vague and open whether the same uh, principle applies to facilitation, uh, uh, facilitation of entry, bringing people or transiting people into France. And here we had the... Uh, uh, in because he's seen as uh, um, facilitating transit uh, or, or also uh, Brianson 7 case uh, was also re related to that and kind of um, prosecutors tried to attack all this uh, mobilization by, by kind of slapping on, onto uh, mobilizations that have been happening in these border areas of France so also by, by portraying all the um, uh, Wale as rebel Wale and kind of tr trying to portray uh, and appeal as many times like uh, Manoni case has been appealed four times by state prosecutors. So it's showing that maybe it's not the initial case that got this attention, but the kind of 
escalating uh, discussion and discourse around this case and mobilizations are the things, in fact, that prosecutors are the most afraid. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Lina. I wanted to also give Carmina the chance to comment on what you thought of the significance of the dismissal of uh, Cedric Yeru's case, but also we've had some other questions to you. I mean, if you um, know anything about the, the cases that we've seen in Belgium or the Netherlands about illegal uh, entry. Um, also, uh, someone rightly noticed that there don't really seem to be cases, at least that we've identified, coming out of uh, Central Europe. There was one case in, in Croatia, so could you say uh, a little bit about that? And also, more generally, people are interested in the, the database that we've created with uh, Rizoma. You know, what, what can we tell about the kinds of cases? What are we gathering? Um, and also, how can people get in touch with you? So, one last big question to, to you, um, but just answer what you can. And again, um, people can get in touch with everyone bilaterally. Yes. Um, first of all, on Sadiq Eru, I mean, it's very important what happened yesterday because this is an emblematic case of criminalization solidarity that really had a lot of mediatic attention and also shed light on the problem back in 2017 and also led, as Lina was saying, to the French Constitutional Court ruling on the principle of fraternity. So the hope is that uh, this, will be, uh, you will, this will set the legal precedent also uh, for other cases and will impact also, uh, for instance, the case of Pierre Manoni that is very similar, at, if I'm not wrong, uh, it will be tried by the same court that uh, Cedric Riu, um, that was working on the case of Cedric Riu. So, Maybe in the next month we can see if uh, there was a, also an impact of the, this, the, of the Constitutional French Court on, uh, on cases at lower level uh, in, uh, in France. So I think that's, we should, that's very important development. And also more in general, uh, um, I mean, yes, we, in our database we collect, we have collected at least uh, so far cases of investigation and formal constitution that, as Lina said, you already said, it's only part, um, one part of the bigger of uh, the problem. Um, participants can really be in touch with us and um, by emails with the contact that uh, uh, we are sharing here. Uh, and uh, if, they are, if they are aware of any cases or investigation that is taking place in the member states uh, on, on hope, of um, the taxation directive, they can really uh, be in touch uh, with us and we can uh, keep collecting the case that it, this is one also uh, our main uh, goal of our project. And also uh, I can say that, yeah, with regard to the central uh, European countries, we have not identified many cases there. There is real a gap, uh, but we have identified other uh, problems. Um, we have identified that this is an hostile environment. There are many obstacles, uh, regulatory obstacles, administrative barriers that apply that make the life of NGOs more difficult. So uh, just the example of uh, Hungary or Poland where there are several obstacles to access funding or registration requirements uh, uh, to carry out fundamental activities are in practice undermining uh, the work of uh, uh, NGOs and, uh, and volunteers. So as uh, Lina already said, this is uh, criminalization solidarity is not, lot, it's not only formal prosecution, uh, but also suspicious intimidation, harassment, uh, uh, and uh, uh, other um, problems. Thank you, Carmina. I'm sorry that this uh, webinar went over, but our Q&A section just exploded because so many of you are working directly on this. I had things that I couldn't talk about from Hayes, uh, Lesbos, the Helsinki, uh, the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, NGOs in Finland, in Spain. Um, we want to continue uh, to be gathering your information because the European Commission is this year guiding, uh, working on guidelines uh, that they hope to publish coming through the courts and hopefully uh, can be heard uh, at the European level. And every time there are cases, good and bad. It's a chance to communicate and raise awareness and show actually that Europeans want change. So thank you uh, so much for, for joining us. Please uh, get in touch with us if you have information at SEPS Migration Policy Group uh, or PECOM. Again, this webinar is going to be uh, shared on YouTube and uh, on Facebook. So reshare it, tweet Defend Solidarity, and we'll see you either on 
social media, um, eventually for meetings, uh, who knows, maybe in front of the European Court of Justice or in front of the European Parliament. So thank you. I look forward to the next time we can meet together. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs> well done. Yes. Thank you to uh, Chun from SEPS, uh, who has secretly been making this whole thing uh, possible. Uh, to Hint, who did all of the promotion uh, coordination, a lot of the visuals, uh, who was helping me out at frantic moments, uh, uh, to Pecom, uh, to everyone else who's involved in this webinar.